time for questions to the Minister of Finance and Personnel. And I call Ms. Megan Ferrin. Question one, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. There are three points for me from the IMF report. The first is that a high level of public sector debt represents a burden on the economy which must be dealt with. However, it is the pace of repayment that is in question, and in that regard, the United Kingdom has room to manoeuvre. In such circumstances, rushing to pay down debt could be the worst of two evils. The report reaffirms my view that debt should be tackled, but in a way that reflects the circumstances of all the United Kingdom regions. I thank the Minister for her answer so far. Um, would the Minister agree that, aside from being harmful, um, continued cuts to our block grant by the British Government are not only needless but also counterproductive? Well, in relation to uh, the deficit, that has to be uh, dealt with, and as part of the United Kingdom, we have to play our role uh, in dealing with the deficit. Uh, the deficit peaked at £153 billion, pounds, around 10.2% of national income in 2009-2010. Clearly that was something that was unsustainable uh, and therefore uh, if she reads the IMF discussion paper which she's referred to in her question, uh, she will note that indeed debt does have to be tackled. I think uh, where I may differ uh, from the Chancellor and his plans uh, slightly is the fact that I do believe that when you are dealing with the debt issue and you are dealing with the deficit issue, uh, that you do need to have concern and regard to all of the regions of the United Kingdom, and uh, this is comments that I've made uh, previously in relation uh, to this issue, that you don't just look at London and the South East, that you do have to have regard uh, to all of the other regions of the United Kingdom, and I think that's really uh, where we need to focus in our discussions uh, with our national government, um, with the Chancellor and with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury. Call Brenda Hill. Speaker, um, and I thank the Minister for, for her answers. Minister, the member opposite is clearly and sadly not aware of what is happening in Greece, which is a very real reason why, is a very real reason of, of um, example of austerity. Would the Minister agree that this alone is a reason why we should live within our means? I have to say, certainly, the Greece uh, situation is a very worrying situation for a number of reasons. Uh, it certainly uh, does point to the, the, uh, the issue that the member has raised in relation to just avoiding dealing with national debt. You can't do that. You have to uh, grasp the nettle and, and deal uh, with the deficit, with the debt. Uh, but in relation to Greece uh, in general, certainly there are worrying times ahead because of Greece exits, and it looks increasingly like Greece is going to uh, exit uh, the euro then that's going to lead to a time of grave uncertainty for the Eurozone. Thankfully, we're not in the Euro, so that gives us some protection, but that will be uh, of no comfort, I have to say, Mr. Speaker, to our exporters who are exporting uh, to the European uh, Union generally and to the Eurozone in particular. So there are worrying times ahead, particularly for our exporters, and we will do all we can to support them, but that's in the knowledge that there are difficult times ahead. And I call Mr. Ali Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, this morning at the High Court in Belfast, uh, the High Court ruled that the Assembly or the Executive had a legal duty to adopt an anti-poverty strategy, that it had not done so, and that it was in breach of its legal obligations. Could I ask the Minister, if not now, soon, perhaps by a written statement, to advise members about what the consequences are of the High Court ruling? in respect of ongoing budget and welfare issues, not least uh, in the context of what may happen on the 8th of July and how that might impact, impact upon people who are deemed to be poor in Northern Ireland. I thank the member for the information. I was not aware of that court case and I'm sure that OFM, DFM, who have uh, policy responsibility for that issue, will come to the House in due course, obviously after they have had uh, a chance to consider the judgment. Uh, in relation to poverty in Northern Ireland, I do want to say to the member that his continued refusal to implement welfare reform proposals in Northern Ireland will lead to uh, an awful lot of people in very difficult circumstances right across Northern Ireland uh, in terms of public services. And he uh, shouldn't lecture me on dealing uh, with those in poverty. He should try and stop people going into poverty. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Minister referred to the IMF report 
um, which also stated, and it's very important to note, that inherited public debt represents a deadweight burden on the economy, which reduces both its investment potential and its growth prospects. Does the Minister agree with this? Well, I do, and, and I have to say to the member, I'm glad that he, he did reference that. I did try to reference that in my substantive answer because it's uh, very clear, and Christi uh, Christine Lagarde has said, uh, you may recall that uh, I think the IMF, first of all, criticised the Chancellor of the Exchequer for the way in which he was dealing uh, with the deficit, and then had to come back and apologise uh, for that criticised. And, and, and afterwards, she said uh, that, in fact, there was no one way to deal with uh, the particular issue that she was talking about. So there are different ways to deal with the issues. I think uh, we have to recognise, and uh, it would be wrong of us not to recognise, that the deficit has reduced uh, to uh, over £70 billion pounds now from a high of one, uh, uh, 153. Uh, and that's important, and I think we need to recognise that. But we also need to recognise that different regions of the United Kingdom will have different needs. And I think that's where we need to really push ahead uh, in respect with the Chancellor and the Chief Secretary to the Treasury. And could I inform members that question six has been withdrawn? And I call Mr Jim Allister. Question two. The Executive's budget for 2015-16 is predicated on full implementation of the Stormont House Agreement. I now expect all parties to follow through on the commitments given in that agreement, including implementation of welfare reform. Going to call Jim Allister for supplement. Perhaps the Minister would take a moment to explain to the House the significance of the Treasury control limits, and could you explain how, in monitoring the implementation of the budget, uh, when she has to measure that against the allocations, how that can be done authentically when, when the allocations are themselves inflated by £604 million? And will that be something with, with which the Treasury will acquiesce? Well, as the member is aware, uh, I did have a meeting with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury uh, some two weeks ago now. Uh, we did have the opportunity. Uh, to talk around uh, these issues. Uh, at that meeting, he made it clear there would be no extra money and that we could not breach our control totals. Um, they haven't made it clear uh, what they will do uh, if we did breach our control totals, uh, because first and foremost, of course, it's a matter and responsibility of uh, this executive to live within uh, our means to live within the money that has been allocated uh, to us. Uh, but as I think I said to the member during the budget debate uh, last week, uh, if we have no welfare reform, we have no Stormont House agreement, we have no assembly and we have no executive. So we will not come up to a situation uh, of trying to deal with the situation he has mentioned. How do we, how do we measure against those allocations? How do we deal with that issue? Uh, because this Assembly cannot continue with a budget uh, that would seek to deal with that, that size of a cut to the public sector, uh, and therefore uh, we would not be able to proceed. So, therefore, it is imperative, uh, and I will say this many, many times today, no doubt, during the budget debate, we need welfare reform implemented and we need the full Stormont House Agreement implemented. Thank you. And I call Mr Alistair Law. I know that the Minister was visiting with her Welsh counterpart uh, last week, and I wondered, although the, the Welsh don't have to grapple with the difficulty of, of welfare reform, whether there was any novel approaches to budgetary issues that uh, she had learnt lessons from the Welsh, or whether any of the other regions across the United Kingdom have different approaches to we do, and whether there's lessons to be learnt there. Well, I thank the member for his question. I did indeed have a very constructive meeting with my counterpart uh, in Wales. Um, she tangentially mentioned welfare uh, insofar as she said that she would not be looking for welfare powers to be devolved to Wales, uh, which I think is possibly uh, very wise. Um, we did have a very useful discussion around the Barnet formula um, and how Wales feels uh, that is working for them. And of course, under the Barnet formula in relation to funding, they are worse off than we are here uh, in Northern Ireland, and they want to look at how they can. Uh, bring in an element of, of need, and of course we discussed that very issue here in the chamber last week in relation to the Barnet formula and how the committee had a report uh, into that issue. Uh, and just in relation to trying to engage the public generally 
Uh, in financial issues, we had a good discussion around how we could engage more uh, with the public uh, in, in, in being aware of the decisions that had to be taken uh, in relation to a fixed budget. How do you decide on your priorities? How do government departments decide what is very important uh, to deal with? So a very good engagement and one that we will continue with. And I call Ms. Rosie McCarley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers thus far. And, and could I ask the Minister, has she considered the implementation of new levies to generate much needed local finance? Well, I don't know if the member is suggesting water charges or what the member is actually uh, talking about. Of course, if uh, the member's ministers want to bring forward um, suggestions in relation to revenue raising, I'm sure the executive will give it due consideration. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the minister, during, I thank the minister for her answer up to now. Uh, she mentioned during her answer her meeting with uh, the Chief Secretary of the Treasury. Can I ask the Minister uh, if she received from the Chief Secretary any indications of the impact of the Chancellor's uh, planned statement uh, for this region? Well, as the member knows, when his various members have asked that question of the Secretary of State, uh, they get the same answer as I got from the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, that we would find out what the implications would be for us on the 8th of July, because they are not going to tell us uh, what the quantum is before they make uh, the announcement uh, to the House of Commons uh, on that date. However, I, I think that we are very aware of the commitments uh, which the Conservative Party made in their manifestos uh, before the general election, and so we have a fair idea as to the sort of areas that they are looking at when it comes to dealing with further uh, cuts in terms of welfare and in terms of other issues. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, um, and thank the Minister for, for her answers thus far. Minister, uh, when you're dealing with the current situation and the spending by departments, there are those departments which are prudent when it comes to discretionary spending, and there are those departments which are spending regardless. How do you intend to deal with that matter? Well, I did send uh, a note uh, around departments, um, I think it's about a month ago now, um, advising them that they should be prudent in relation to discretionary spend, uh, that they shouldn't commit uh, to further spend which was not necessary and which they had not committed to. Uh, and I suppose it's for each individual minister who is responsible to his own, uh, for his own department, his or her own department, uh, as to what they do in relation to that. But uh, fundamentally, that will come to the executive and we will have a discussion in relation to that. But I think it would be very foolish for any minister uh, to continue to spend without any regard to the situation that we find ourselves in. Of course, uh, if uh, the Storm House Agreement was implemented, if welfare reform was implemented, then we could continue uh, with our discretionary spend and we could continue to deal with uh, areas of very great need that there are uh, right across Northern Ireland. But again, it comes back to the very fundamental issue that without welfare reform, there's no Stormont House Agreement and therefore there, there isn't the flexibilities available to us uh, which we require to move forward. Thank you. And I call Mr. Robin Newton. Mr. Speaker, question number three. Uh, members will be aware that the reason Mersey Street is closed to most traffic is to facilitate ongoing work by Northern Ireland Water in order to improve drainage and alleviate the threat of future floods. Whilst I am sympathetic to the issues raised by uh, business owners as a result of the ongoing schemes both in Mersey Street and indeed uh, on the Castlereagh Road, the member will, I am sure, understand that I simply cannot issue a blanket rate rebate to ratepayers in the area. I thank the Minister for her comments, uh, and I know that the Minister will understand from her previous role in enterprise trade and investment the absolute uh, need for those small businesses that are suffering uh, as a result of the diversionary traffic uh, measures that are in place. I, I wonder would the Minister be uh, willing to raise the matter, minded to raise the matter around the executive table and perhaps urge the appropriate minister 
to see if anything can be done to actually accelerate the scheme and alleviate the problems for the small businesses that are being impacted upon. I do thank the member for his comments and, and his, his question. Um, I'm fully aware of what's going on uh, down in Mersey Street and uh, do feel a lot of sympathy because, as I understand it, that scheme was to be finished uh, by the end of May, but because of unforeseen issues uh, relating to the ground and, and what have you, it is now uh, projected that it will not be completed, Mr Speaker, until December of this year, and that's nearly a whole year of um, businesses having to deal with this issue. Uh, and whilst I, I and I, I'm looking forward to meeting with the member uh, indeed in relation to this issue and with, uh, some business uh, people from the area. And whilst I can't issue a, a blanket um, uh, rebate, uh, I would say to him that individuals can apply to the district valuer to have their rates looked at. Um, so I would encourage him perhaps if there's particular incidences uh, of hardship uh, that he should perhaps uh, encourage them uh, to have a conversation uh, with the district valuer in relation to a specific issue because uh, it looks as if this issue is going to be around for some time. And I, I do have to say, uh, Mr Speaker, it's not just happening in Mersey Street. There's been other examples and indeed at a constituency level and in a skill in present there are roads works. And whilst we very much welcome the fact that works are going on in those particular areas to deal with issues, uh, sometimes I think a little bit more thought needs to go into the planning uh, of the road works and indeed uh, how we can help businesses through the time that the road works uh, go ahead. So certainly I am happy to mention it uh, to the Minister involved uh, and indeed raise it at the executive table. And, uh I have to remind members that this is a very specific uh, question in relation to a constituency, so it comes to Crystal. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I uh, thank the, the Minister for acknowledging the, the hardship that has been caused to residents and businesses alike in Mersey Street and indeed on Castlereagh Road as well. I appreciate uh, her answer in terms of not being able to issue a blanket rate rebate, but um, would she uh, raise the issue at the executive table with the, the ministers who do have responsibility for some of the agencies involved in those works to ensure that any other compensatory schemes that may be available are expedited as quickly as possible? Well, as I've already indicated, I, I will certainly raise it at the executive table. I, I do think it's a specific issue uh, for East Belfast at present, but unfortunately there may be others uh, around Northern Ireland as well. And, you know, I do absolutely acknowledge that it's good that the road service and NI Water are undertaking works in particular areas to alleviate floods, because we do remember the damage that happened. Um, back a couple of years ago, and it's good that the works are taking place, but you have to also recognise that businesses need to function and, and need to be able to attract people into them, and therefore uh, there needs to be a balance and there does need to be a proportional uh, response to deal with the issue. I call Ms Karen McEvitt and I'm looking forward to this connection. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Uh, De uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, like in East Belfast, uh, I myself in South Down have experienced um, <laughs> some, some of the issues, and uh, indeed it was to do with, with flooding issues, uh, even in my own constituency office in Newry Street and Warren Point. I just let the member know that land and property services won't entertain you unless the street uh, in question is closed for more than 12 months. So maybe the minister can take that information to the executive table and maybe that we'll be able to relook at that because it does affect uh, businesses, uh, particularly roads closed for, for a long time and it, it's, not a, it's not a laughing matter so maybe the Minister could take... Thank you. Well I, I, I do recognise that it has to be uh, a disruption for a considerable period of time uh, before the rates can, can look at uh, a new rate of evaluation in respect of the business concern, in respect of the small business concern, uh, and particularly, I suppose, in the context of a revaluation, um, just having rolled out uh, this year, uh, it may be somewhat difficult. But I do think uh, there is a role to look at how the works are progressing. Are there any other ways uh, which we could deal with traffic management uh, to get people to come to the businesses? Uh, is there more signage that we could involve ourselves in? I think there, there are other ways to help businesses, and uh, I think we need to look at that proactively and in an innovative way, and not with a closed mind to helping those businesses. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Robin Swan is not in his place, so I call Lord Morrow. Question number five. 
the Barnett formula is used by Her Majesty's Government to determine changes in the spending allocations of the devolved administrations. It is applied uniformly across the United Kingdom as set out in the Statement of Funding Policy, with devolved administrations receiving a population-based proportion of cho uh, changes in planned spending on comparable services in England, Scotland and Wales or Great Britain as appropriate. The Lord Morrow for uh, I thank uh, the Minister for her answer. Um, could I ask the, the Minister, would you agree with me that surely sticking with the Barnet formula is the best way forward here, rather than going on to some new untried system? But could or is there room for improvement in the administration of the Barnet formula? I certainly think the debate last week uh, pointed to some of the weaknesses of the Barnett formula, but also talked about uh, the strengths uh, of the Barnett formula. And certainly there was a, a view expressed, and one which I probably concur with, that it's better the devil you know. Um, in terms of the Barnett formula, of course, it gives us certainty. Uh, it's relatively simple. I use the word relatively uh, simple uh, and easy to administer. Uh, but that's not taken away from the fact that there are uh, difficulties with it. And I suppose with any formula uh, in relation to uh, dealing with public finances and how that is divvied up against Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, there are always going to be challenges as for each of the administrations. I do have to say, though, uh, in terms of how we benefit from the Barnet mechanism, uh, we do benefit to the tune of 23 per cent higher than the United Kingdom average. So currently, we certainly are benefiting from the Barnet formula. I'm going to call Conor Murphy. Well, Ms. Cancorla, uh, and thank the Minister for her answers. She does, as uh, she said in her answer, recognise that there are difficulties uh, with the Barnet formula as well. One of the difficulties she may agree is the, the fact that financial benefits from policy changes in the executive are not retained by the executive but returned to Westminster. And does she agree with the recommendation of the, the uh, Smith Commission for Scotland that such the, the result of such policy changes should be retained by the devolved uh, institution themselves, and has she had any discussion with the Treasury in relation to that? I haven't had any discussion uh, on that particular issue as yet, but I would imagine we will have discussions around the Smith principles. Uh, I, I'm having a meeting with uh, John Swinney. Uh, in early August, uh, and then we're having a trilateral uh, with Jane Hutt from the Welsh Administration. Uh, and certainly, we will be looking at where we can uh, coalesce around the difficulties with the Barnet formula, because obviously they may have different emphasis uh, in relation to what changes they want made. Uh, but I, 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 and if the member is referring to the sort of issue that we've talked about in relation to corporation tax and the fact that at the moment secondary benefits aren't able to be retained uh, in Northern Ireland, certainly that's something that we want to explore uh, with the Treasury and um, with the Chief Secretary because we very firmly believe that secondary benefits should be retained here in Northern Ireland so that the no detriment principle of Smith uh, applies to us here in Northern Ireland. And I call Sean Roger. And thanks to the Minister for your, for your reply thus far. Minister, with respect to your discussions with, the, with your Welsh counterpart, are there any particular lessons around the Barnet formula that you would like to bring back to the House? Well, of course, the Welsh uh, aren't as fortunate as us, as us in relation to the Barnet formula, and they are uh, at a disadvantage because when the Barnet formula started, they had a lower baseline and they have uh, suffered as a result of that. And the Welsh are very keen on the idea of a Barnet floor uh, coming into play so that, they're, that they don't fall below a certain level. Uh, and certainly, I, I'm quite attracted to that uh, from the terms of what we discussed last week around convergence issues, uh, because, of course, uh, in bad times, actually, the convergence doesn't happen. Uh, so we haven't seen a, a convergence happen as yet. But if the convergence does happen, I think a Barnet floor would be a useful mechanism, and it's something uh, that we will continue to discuss, uh, particularly with the Welsh, but I'm sure the Scots will have a view on that issue as well. Thank you. And it comes to Roy Bay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, while some have criticism of the Barnet formula, I would have a view that it has been relatively generous, uh, providing an additional £2,000 per head of population, recognising the needs of Northern Ireland. Would the Minister agree with me? that with the call for further um, devolution of fiscal powers to regions of the UK, that that Barnet formula could come increasingly under review, and could she advise us of what her approach is to that, 
and uh, what are thoughts as to how to uh, best protect uh, the needs of Northern Ireland? Well, I do think that the Barnet formula hasn't uh, disadvantaged us in Northern Ireland in the way in which it has to Wales, for example. And as I, I indicated, we are 23% better off. Uh, if you look uh, at very recent figures, I think uh, I talked about it last week in the House that it was 2,000 uh, or a little more over the average that we received more uh, than the UK average here in Northern Ireland per head of population. So certainly uh, it has provided us uh, with a good example. But I do anticipate that there will be further discussions in relation to the Barna formula. Of course, when the Barna formula came in, it was only meant to be a temporary measure to deal with uh, allocation, and it's been in since 1978. Uh, it just shows that some things never change. Things that come in as temporary measures uh, stay, but like income tax. Um, so, therefore, um, we will have a discussion around that, and I'm sure it will form part of the discussion when we're looking at the next spending round as well. Thank you. And I call Mr. Gordon Dup. Mr. Speaker. Uh, the delay in implementing welfare reform is already placing additional constraints upon the resources available to the executive. Continued non-implementation of welfare reform will jeopardise the financial package agreed at the Stormont House, uh, increasing these constraints. This cannot fail to have a significant detrimental impact on the ability of departments to deliver public services. The costs of not implementing welfare reform are forecast to escalate significantly in the years ahead, potentially placing further pressure on key public services. Now is the time for either the parties around the chambers to live up to the Stormont House Agreement or for Westminster to step in and deal with the welfare issue. Doing nothing is simply not an option. Thank you. And I call Mr Gordon. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers. Can the Minister advise on the impact of the on the budget of the non-implementation of the Stormont House Agreement? Well, of course, uh, the implementation of welfare reform is central uh, to the Stormont House Agreement. That's a point that's been made many, many times by myself, but also by others, not least the Secretary of State uh, back in March when she was in the United States. Uh, failure to progress welfare reform uh, cast doubts on the other flexibilities which were negotiated in the Stormont House Agreement that really underpin the budget, and that's why it's so fundamental to the budget proceeding. Uh, Key flexibilities uh, included the capacity to use £200 million of uh, RRI borrowing to fund workforce restructuring uh, this year, and of course the flexibility to repay the £100 million access to the UK Reserve in 14-15, and the £114 million reductions for non-implementation of welfare reform from capital budgets. So quite fundamental issues and therefore there is a real, really great need to have welfare reform implemented as soon as possible. Call Mr. Loris. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I want to ask the Minister, does she share my concern in relation to the recent report uh, findings of the Office of National Statistics, which said that, uh, on average, the income of an average household here is some £6,000 less than any other region within the United Kingdom. And if that be in the case, uh, uh, as well as the predicted onslaught on uh, working uh, credits and tax credits, child tax credits predicted in the 8th of July budget, what representation of any uh, has she made to the uh, Department of Works and Pensions? Well, it's not my job to make uh, representations to the Department of Work and Pensions. I will make representations, of course, to the Chief Secretary of the Treasury and the Chancellor in relation to these issues. It is disappointing to note uh, the low level of wages in Northern Ireland, of course, that is to do with productivity uh, and the fact that our productivity has uh, fallen. Um, I think the way to deal with that issue, of course, is to bring more high-value jobs into Northern Ireland. It is something that we have spent a lot of time engaging in and to make sure that uh, we have the skills available uh, for our young people so that they can access those jobs with higher wages. And that is the way we deal with the low-wage economy, to make this economy more competitive, uh, to grow the private sector, to engage in more research and development and more innovation so that we can move out uh, of this growing productivity gap between ourselves and the rest of the United Kingdom, something about which I must say I am very concerned. A very quick supplementary from our new member, Neil Somerville. Mr. Speaker, the cost of failure to introduce the welfare reform this year is an estimated 
at £114 million. What is the Minister's estimate for the cost next year? Well, the estimate for the cost next year rises to £196 million, that's for 2016-17. 2017-18 that rises to 283 million and 2018-19 up to 366 million but of course that's on the current welfare uh, situation in Great Britain if that changes and we understand that it will change in the very near future then the gap between ourselves and the rest uh, of the United Kingdom will grow even further Thank you and that brings us to the, uh, the end of the period for listed questions we now move on to topicals and question one has been withdrawn within the appropriate arrangements. So I call Mr Stuart Dixon. Thank you, uh, Principal Speaker. Um, Minister, could you give us your uh, best assessment of the financial cost of managing our divided society? And for example, in the duplication of some services, what plans do you have to reduce that duplication? Unfortunately, I don't have the uh, precise figures here in relation to duplication, but uh, uh, I do know that the uh, party which the member represents has spent some time looking at figures in, in, in relation to duplication, particularly in relation to housing uh, and education. I'm aware of those figures. Unfortunately, I don't have the specific figures in front of me, uh, but it's certainly something that I'm happy to have a discussion with the member about, because at a time when we have a, a decrease in our block grant, it's something that we should certainly be addressing. Mr Dixon, for a supplement. Thank you. No doubt the Minister will be aware of an Audit Office report today which is highly critical of the Department of Education in relation to duplication in schools. I think uh, some 70,000 uh, empty desks right across Northern Ireland. It, how can the Minister justify that in the terms of public finance, given the uh, difficult times that we are in? Well, I have to say to the member that it's not my job to stand here and defend how the Minister of Education deals with all of the different sectors which he has remit over. I would be very concerned that new schools are opening in different sectors uh, and pupils are being displaced from sectors that are already there. That's the reality. We have a fixed number of children, so obviously if you open new schools, uh, then those kids with new facilities and everything else are going to move to those schools and therefore leave empty desks at the schools which they have left. Thank you. And I call Mr Jonathan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Minister, um, the Honourable Member for Strangford, uh, Mr Nesbitt, made allegations that over half a billion pounds has been handed back to the Treasury in London. Perhaps you would like to tell this House, are those figures correct? Well, of course they're not correct. Uh, of course they're not correct. Uh, in this last four years, the executive has not lost any resources, not a single resource, uh, that could have been used to fund public services. Uh, and it appears that uh, Mr Nesbitt has assumed that the underspend in any year represents funding return to Treasury. And that's simply not the case, of course. Uh, we can carry the majority of funding forward either under uh, special arrangements in place for the Department of Justice uh, or under the Budget uh, Exchange Scheme, uh, which happens right across the devolved administrations uh, in the United Kingdom. And the only funding, the only funding that's returned to Treasury due to underspend is in respect of ring-fenced resource Dale budget for depreciation and impairments that could not be used for anything other than known cash costs. Well, it couldn't be used for public services, uh, Mr Speaker. So uh, he's wrong, and he's very wrong. Again. Mr Craig, for supplement. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that answer. But of course, I would have to say it's not the first time Mr Nesbitt's got his sums wrong, as we witnessed up in Fermanagh in the selection process. Maybe the Minister could outline to us what the accurate figure is over that same time period. Well, uh, the member makes a, a very salient point uh, in relation uh, to the issue. Uh, and of course, the ring-fenced resource deal that returned uh, for 14.15, and this is a provisional figure, uh, was 30.3 um, million. Uh, and that, as I said, is money that we could not spend on public services. So therefore, it goes back because it's ring-fenced and it's really in relation to depreciation uh, and other issues connected with non-cash. So 
I mean, there's a bit of a difference um, uh, in relation to the figures that were quoted uh, by Mr Nesbitt in a television studio to someone who couldn't deal with the issue at that time because he'd never seen the figures before. Uh, but it's a cheap stunt, uh, I have to say. Uh, but I hope that the papers and the broadcasters give as much coverage to this answer as they did to Mr Nesbitt. Thank you. And Mr Roy Beggs is not in this place. I call Mr Lourdes Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, can I ask the Minister, uh, should the voluntary exit scheme go ahead, can the, the Minister assure the House that there is the capacity within the pensions uh, branch to actually uh, facilitate uh, those persons who wish to leave under the scheme? Well, absolutely there will be. Um, as she knows, the voluntary exit scheme uh, is reliant on the Stormont House Agreement being implemented, so I'm sure any of her constituents who are uh, looking for the voluntary exit scheme will very much want her to go ahead and implement the Stormont House Agreement. Ms Kelly for a supplement. Well, I think, uh, Mr Speaker, with all due respect, it was just about the capacity within pensions branch, so if the Minister could assure the House that they have the capacity in terms of staff resources to deal with uh, the requests. Yes, they have. Okay. Call Mr Paul Gibb. Speaker, uh, could I ask the Minister to provide an update on the number of civil servants who have in indicated their willingness to uh, take up the voluntary exit scheme? Well, overall, um, 7,700 odd people have applied for the voluntary exit scheme uh, across the civil service. Uh, he will know that uh, of that, 1,200 have received conditional offers. Uh, those offers were sent out, um, I think, uh, towards the end of May. Uh, and uh, those wanting uh, to take up those offers have to five o'clock this evening uh, to accept uh, the offer that has been made to them uh, by the civil service. Given for supplement. I appreciate there's still a couple of hours to go until five o'clock. Uh, maybe the minister is in a position to indicate uh, at this stage how many have uh, said that they would take up that conditional offer. Uh, and could the Minister elaborate as to whether or not the uh, offer is indeed subject to Stormont House being implemented and failure to do that will mean that these civil servants uh, who have uh, signed up to the exit package will no longer be able to exit the scheme? Well, just in relation to that last issue, of course, the funding for the, for the voluntary exit scheme comes from the Stormont House uh, agreement negotiations, uh, 200 million uh, from the RRI facility made available this year. If the Stormont House Agreement is not uh, implemented, then that money will not be available uh, to us. Uh, as of one o'clock today, uh, of the, I think I said 1,200, actually, one of those were withdrawn before they went out, so it was 1,199 offers went out. Um, at the end of May. As of one o'clock today, 842 staff had accepted uh, their offer of early exit. 161 uh, had rejected the offer. And as I say, uh, the rest of uh, those uh, people who haven't responded have to five o'clock this evening uh, to respond. And after that, I will give a final update in relation to the numbers. Thank you. And I call Mr Stephen Moutry. Mr Speaker. Does the Minister believe the current overgrown roadsides, verges and central reservations create a very negative image of Northern Ireland this summer? <clears throat> well, I have to say I totally agree with the member. Um, the DRD Minister has commented in the media about how the Executive's budget has required him uh, to make drastic cuts to road maintenance activities, but contrary to what the Minister has implied, his department's non-ring fence resource budget for 15-16 has only been reduced by 0.6 per cent, and that's one of the best outcomes for any department. Uh, so I, I really do urge the minister to look again at the issue, particularly of grass cutting, because it's a, it's a minor issue in the grand scheme of things, but I think uh, it does create an image that we want to avoid, particularly for our tourists that are coming to Northern Ireland. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very poor uh, uh, image that we're presenting to those who visit our country. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her response. Can I ask her, will she encourage the DRD Minister to prioritise his resources in a way that will make Northern Ireland once again an attractive place to live, work and to visit? 
Well, I, I do hope that he uh, will listen to the member's points today. Um, as I say, his uh, non-ring fence resource budget has only been reduced by 0.6 per cent. By contrast, my own department is having to live with a reduction of 10 per cent uh, in terms of non-ring uh, fence resource budget. So uh, it, it's really a matter for the DRD minister, and uh, I assume that the member will raise, and I'm sure he's already raised it, but he will raise again the issue with the DRD Minister to try and get the matter dealt with. And I call Mr. John uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, certainly not under the present Minister's watch, but uh, she will be aware that in the past millions of pounds were made overnight on the sale of government land and property. Is the Minister satisfied that putting the former Shackleton Barracks uh, land of 900 acres on the market is the right thing to do, and is she satisfied that everything humanly possible has been done to exploit that for the creation of jobs? Well, I, I'm sure the member will be pleased to see that movement has uh, finally come in relation to the Shackleton site. Uh, the executive certainly believes, and I believe, that there's a huge opportunity there uh, to be grasped. We very much hope. Uh, that, there, uh, that the interest that has been shown, and I understand that there has been interest shown uh, in the site, will now materialise, given the announcement yesterday by OFM DFM. And uh, I know he is pushing hard for jobs to come to that region, and I hope that he and indeed all of the MLAs for that region will work together with OFM DFM to make it as attractive a site as we possibly can. Mr. Dalit, Dalit for supper. I thank the Minister for, for her very positive answer, and I concur totally with her. But would, would the Minister agree with me that perhaps if a special economic task force had been set up and a master plan had been created for the site, that we might well be in a better position to exploit what she rightly claims is one of the most magnificent sites anywhere in that, that part of, of, of Northern Ireland? Well, I do thank the member for his, his question, and I think there are various ways of how we deal with the regional disparities, and I'm sure he's supportive of the fact that the executive has set up uh, a subcommittee to deal with regional disparities in Northern Ireland, not least my own area, not least his area, uh, because there are issues that go way beyond a particular site. Uh, there are, and uh, the member's colleague, Mr Ramsey, has made this point just last week, around uh, infrastructure deficits. And I think there are infrastructure deficits uh, across Northern Ireland, and we have to deal with those deficits. Uh, there's a real need to have, I uh, hope I'm getting the right digit right, the A6. Am I right in that? <laughs> the A6 uh, dealt with. There's a need to have the A5 dealt with, and indeed all of the other road infrastructure projects across Northern Ireland. So I hope that we can work together through that regional disparity committee to try and deal with much more than just a particular site, but look at the whole region. And I call Ms. Karen Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, in previous questions, the Minister did uh, talk about the re-evaluation of domestic uh, properties or non-domestic properties. Uh, can the Minister indicate uh, or detail the number of appeals um, which have been made in relation to the re-evaluation of non-domestic properties? Well, we've had, um, I don't have a specific figure, but I know it's certainly over 1,000 uh, appeals submitted at the moment. I think that will grow, it will continue to grow as other people decide to uh, ask for uh, a revaluation. Uh, that's not unusual, actually, when you look at the number of revaluations that have taken place. And not to forget, of course, that this is the first revaluation on non domestic properties for 12 years. Uh, and therefore, you can't compare last year's appeals with this year's, as someone in this chamber has done, because we haven't had a revaluation for 12 years. Uh, so it's important that you look back at the last revaluation to see how many appeals there were at that time. Ms. McKevitt for supplement. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Can the minister indicate then how many of these appeals uh, have been successful? We are still at an early stage, and as I have indicated, there are others still coming in. Uh, there are some appeals that are coming in, uh, if you like, in a, a sectoral way. Uh, so, petrol stations, four courts, I think they are coming in together and are making an appeal in relation to the overall methodology uh, in relation to petrol stations. And of course, then you have small and medium sized businesses who just simply don't accept that their rents. Uh, will have gone up in, in such a way. I uh, haven't seen many coming in for a reduction yet, so uh, it will simply be those who have gone up. 
and I call Mr Oliver McMullen and I won't have time for a supplement. <laughs> Can I get concluded? Would, would, the, would the Minister agree with me there is no evidence of any link between the removal of tax credits to the working people and the rise in wages? Well, I have to say, I hope uh, that, uh, and I presume that he's referring to uh, what has been proposed uh, through the Tory party manifesto in relation to working people. Uh, we would, uh, as a party, and I would certainly personally have grave concerns in relation to that, because the whole point uh, uh, of welfare reform in general is to get people into work and all the benefits that flow from being in work, so to actually uh, attack those benefits that help people to get out to work. Uh, will be, I think, a detrimental step uh, in terms of the United Kingdom, and I hope even at this late stage uh, that that will be looked at again. Time is up, and thank you very much, Minister. Um